it's hosted by the Edible Garden Club at Cal State LA. Depending on how you heard of this event, we're not sure if your students are coming from Avon's website, but welcome, we're happy to have you. We're a student run club on campus, well, not on campus, virtually. Um, and our mission is to start an edible garden on campus. So we're kind of in the process of that. We have a site and we have some things in the ground, um, but we're running all of our events virtually right now until we can get access to campus again. And the mission of this garden is kind of in three parts. We want to give students access, but we also want to be able to, it's mostly educationally focused. We want to be able to teach students to grow organic and sustainable food. We want to promote food sovereignty, access and food justice. And we want to provide a living lab to support classes, workshops, community and building. And a lot of that comes in with not only this club serving like with events like these and learning, um, hopefully hands-on learning as well once we get into the garden, but also uh, working in partnership with some professors who have a grant um, that are doing research in this space as well. Here is just a little map of the garden if you've never seen it before. Uh, this is located in housing up in the top right that you can't see is lot five on campus. Um, and this is our space. It's bigger than it looks. It's really cool. Uh, we can't wait to go there and put things in the ground. This is some of these things that are on this map already exist in the garden. Some things are in process. This ADA compliant walkway that you've heard us talk about a lot has still yet to be constructed. <laughs> but we're hoping that it will be soon. And then um, in the summer, we will have LA Compost install a three bin composting system for us. And that's really great. Things that are already in the ground include this row of fruit trees, um, some succulents up here, some sage, and also uh, grape plants and pea plants. Those things are doing well. Um, and there's also a shed. Uh, but some things in the future to be built are these garden beds. Some of them are semi-constructed, some of them not. So it's really exciting. There's a lot to do, but there's there's things happening already. Um, thank you all so much for coming. If you have more questions about the garden space itself, let us know. And if you want to be part of our newsletter and hear more updates about the garden and keep in contact with the club, just uh, put your email in the chat and we can add you to our list. I'm gonna pass it off to Stephanie now. Yes, thank you, Megan. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Estefania. I am the secretary of the Edible Garden Club. I'm also uh, majoring in nutritional science. I will be graduating in May. And I just wanted to thank everyone for, for being here in spirit of National Garden Month. We're very excited to have Yvonne here presenting. And I just wanted to mention a few um, upcoming events that are happening in the month of April. Uh, there are, these are all presented by the gardeninla.net. So Yvonne's website uh, for further information, you can log on to there. I can put it in the chat as well. And there is going to be an event from April 9th uh, to the 11th um, regarding tomato mania in Descanso uh, Gardens in La Cañada. And then on the 10th through the 11th, there's gonna be an, a spring plant sale from UC Riverside. And we're also going to have Yvonne speak for our club in collaboration with the Environmental Policy Committee on the 16th regarding container gardening. So if you're interested in that, we can provide you with more information. And there's also the, um, the 18th annual Theodore Payne uh, native gardening tour, native garden tour, excuse me, on the 16th through the 19th. Um, so those are a couple of events that are happening in, happening in April. So we, we encourage you to, to join in and um, just get involved as much as you can. So next slide. And here's just a little bit more information um, geared toward the container gardening workshop that we'll be having on the 16th um, with Yvonne thankfully. <laughs> and we have the Zoom meeting ID and we'll be sending up, uh, we'll be sending a follow-up email with the handout that she'll be providing for her presentation. In spirit of National Garden Month, we wanted to provide a topic that was regarding seasonal gardening, gardening that is geared towards our climate in Southern California and who better to 
present on this topic than former UC Master Gardener Coordinator Yvonne Savio with her wealth of knowledge and all of her experience in horticulturalism. So I want to thank you all for attending the meeting and taking some time to learn about how to cultivate different vegetables and herbs. And just a little background on Yvonne. She is a Cal State LA alumna and she earned her degree from Cal State LA in English. She received her horticultural degree from the American River College in Sacramento. As I previously mentioned, she served as a UC coordinator in the extension with Los Angeles County as a master gardener. And she has 20 plus years of experience. So she is considered a wealth of knowledge and, and the best person to, to be providing this presentation today. She's also received numerous recognitions, such as the celebration of public service during the Obama administration in 2015. As she went on to retire that same year, she, she still dedicates her time to teaching newcomers on various gardening topics and experimenting in her own gardening with drought tolerant strategies for growing vegetables, fruits, roses, and succulents. And so today I'm pleased to hand over the floor to Yvonne Savio herself so she can uh, get the presentation started. If anyone has any questions that you are curious about regarding this topic or any gardening questions in general, please leave them in the chat and we'll hold off questions until the end. Thank you all. And my website, and this was an outgrowth of my uh, training the master gardeners for some 20 years. Um, when I retired in 2015, I started my own website, and that includes job opportunities and upcoming gardening events, uh, monthly tips, uh, which if you printed them out, it'd probably be 10 pages worth of goodies. So it's definitely a variety of uh, approaches for every month. Um, but the particularly new thing on my website that I think will intrigue many people, especially who live in Southern California, is that I do a blog every couple of weeks about what's literally happening in my garden at that moment. Uh, for example, when we had that tremendous heat a couple of years ago for a couple of days, the week before I was urging people to water their gardens deeply, and then right after the heat, I admonished people not to do any pruning of uh, what looked to be dead on their plants because um, two months later then, I urged them to do the pruning and everybody was so amazed that there was still so much that was alive on their plants that they would have trimmed away. And, any of that trimming that they had done uh, would have stressed their plants even more. So there's all these kinds of ramifications to what you're doing in the garden. Um, and so by my experience in my own garden, I hope to illustrate to people and discuss uh, why they should be doing something or not doing something at any particular time. And consequently, they certainly can uh, connect with me and ask me what's going on with what's happening in their gardens. Another thing that is, I think, of particular fun on my website is my news tab. This is where articles that I find online, um, I post them on my website just because they are particularly intriguing to me about new plants or old plants or something. So there's also a web links page that has the recommended University of California links and also wonderful links of uh, science-based information um, from non-university sources. And thirdly on that page for the web links is my web appearances. And there's quite a few of the Zoom presentations that I have made that are posted there and also my visit when Huell Hauser came to my garden uh, talking about recycling and repurposing items as tools in the garden. So there's lots to be able to enjoy on there. And if you would like to get onto my mailing list, um, 
to receive announcement of when I put out the new jobs or um, the um, some of the events and also my blogs, um, please email me at the bottom there on your screen. You'll see gardeningnla at gmail.com. Okay, let's move on with veggies and herbs. Again, um, when you have questions, please put it in the chat and then we'll deal with all those afterwards because many times people's questions are something that I just haven't quite come to in my presentation. So, there are quite a few uh, fruits and vegetables that are native to the Americas. And this photo was taken years ago at a farmer's market that had so many of the plants labeled that we consider to be everyday foods for us but just recognizing where they had initiated in the world. So you've got beans, blueberries, corn, cucumbers, grapes, potatoes, squash, strawberries, sweet potatoes, prickly pear cactus, tomatoes, all of those come from somewhere else. Most of them South America, Central and South America. And I had the opportunity when my husband and I had uh, gone down to Peru, um, I had been working up at UC Davis uh, with the potato statewide expert. And one of the people who, the scientists who had come up from Peru um, was from the International Potato Center. So when I went down to Peru, I arranged with him to go to the center and they put out a table that was about four foot by eight foot with about 200 different kinds of potatoes on that table. And they were just amazing. There was um, even one that was called the puma paw and it was because it looked like the paw of a puma. So it was just fantastic. And of course, there, there were no potatoes that looked regular like, you know, this, one russet potato or even this purple potato here. They were all just terribly strange looking, um, but it was just fascinating seeing all those different original potatoes. So the um, one I'll deal with the category first is fall and winter. And these are the cool season crops and there are, um, different parts of the plant that we actually eat. The ones that we eat the roots, some of them are a little strange to figure out, but botanically, these are the roots. So we have, of course, beets with its several different kinds of colors. We have carrots, which the original carrots from Turkey were this dark purple, but through breeding through the ages, um, it was determined that the orange ones were the ones that were most preferred by people all through history since their discovery in Turkey. So now, of course, in the last couple of years, um, more of the colors are being rebred uh, or picked back from the uh, orange ones in order to have more of a rainbow of carrots. We've got parsnips, radishes. Notice all the different kinds of radishes that there are. This is also a, a photo I took from uh, one of the farmer's markets. And this one, my apologies for the blurriness of it. This is one of those, um, I don't know if this is a daikon or a, a turnip, but it certainly is, uh, again, eating the root. Stems, this is where it gets a little strange seeming because you would think that this is just a regular shoot. But in fact, this is the stem and each one of these little sections here will then become that fern and is more of a leaf. Whereas potatoes, this is a swollen stem. And then each of the green parts that goes up for the foliage is 
a leaf. Leaves that we eat are feel more obvious. Cabbages, celery, lettuces, even an onion. This is the leaf. This is the roots and that little tiny hard piece that you usually cut out when you are cutting up onions. That is the stem. And then these, as they are rolled all around it, are the leaves, spinaches, and even pea shoots. Now the pea shoots were really a completely new part of the plant for me to consider eating. And I came upon it when we were still up in Davis and I went to the Sacramento farmer's market. And this was at the time when um, so many of the Southeast Asian peoples had gone through tremendous wars in their countries and they were being um, moved or choosing to move to California, well, all over the United States. But we had quite a batch of them that were coming to the Sacramento area as well as the Fresno area. And they were the ones that brought some of this to the farmer's markets. And so, of course, I had only known about eating the peas, you know, the fruit of the pea bush. And so I had never seen this before. And they um, indicated to me that this is just a really nice green. You'll just toss it in your salad raw or your stir fry it or whatever, just like any other green. But of course, once you trim off a good portion of this shoot, it, the plant is going to send up more shoots. And so you'll continue to um, end up with your peas on there. But like many uh, vegetables have different uses for um, that some of the uses you will prefer a certain variety over another one. And there was a batch of peas that I just found seeds for a couple of years ago of the peas that were called magnolia. Interesting conjunction of a flower's name with a edible pea variety. However, the thing about it was that it would put out a tremendous number of all the tendrils like this. And consequently, it occurred to me that that might be an excellent plant to use as my pea shoot plant. Uh, as it was, I let it grow out completely and it had purple um, pods with the green peas on the inside. The other thing I wanted to urge you to grow was celery, especially if you are a cook and you particularly like doing um, soups and stews and things like that. You know, when we buy celery in the market, it's really pretty much cut off at this point. There's very little of the foliage on there. It's just those stalks. And so it may seem a little strange when you grow it that it ends up having at least half of the plant is all this wonderful foliage. And that's why it's so wonderful for a cook because you can use all of this wonderful foliage as part of your soup or your stew or anything else that's going to be the combination. But you do want to make sure that you grow this in the cool weather because you have to put lots of water on it in order to keep the turgidity of the stalk. You know, if they start getting really wobbly, um, it means that it doesn't have enough water. The cool season uh, vegetables that we eat immature flowers are the artichoke, broccoli, cauliflower. So you may have known if you have grown them before, you'll know that the next step of this is that these outer scales open completely up and this what looks like a bottle brush comes out from the inside and it's a brilliant purple. So it is quite beautiful, but at that point, there's no flesh left in these outer scales or at the base of the artichoke, which is called the heart. 
Now the broccoli, when it comes up, all the little buds that are going to become flowers remain very, very tight um, in this head. Once you cut off the head, then at each one of the joints of all of the leaves, there will be little tiny heads that are coming up. And those will be about the size that you would have cut the big one into bite-sized pieces. There is a variety, uh, it's called purple sprouting broccoli that is made, it does not put out that uh, big head at the beginning. The only thing it ever puts out are tons and tons of those little tiny broccolettes, little tiny broccoli heads that seem to be already in the size that you're going to be, uh, bite size that you're going to be eating. And there have been studies made where the purple sprouting broccoli plant ends up giving more than twice the amount of broccoli to be eaten than if you grow a regular kind of broccoli, cut off the main head and then eat all the remaining or the developing um, little heads to it. So in terms of the amount of food that the plant produces, the purple sprouting is a good way to go. Now this is a cross between a broccoli and a cauliflower, and it's called a broccoli flower. And the beautiful thing about it is that it has this very geometric pattern to it. Um, these little individual pointy heads, it, and it tastes very mild. So um, if somebody doesn't particularly like broccoli because they say it tastes too strong, um, either um, harvest it when it's much younger or try growing the broccoli flower. Now, the one exception, you know, we've talked about the roots, stems, leaves, and immature flowers, uh, parts of the plants that we eat, the one exception for cool season crops is that um, those are the only parts of the plant that we eat. The exception is that we eat the fruit on a pea that is a cool season grower. Everything else, it's one of those immature parts. So the best conditions for growing fall and winter um, crops are that the air temperature is between 55 and 75, which of course is what's happening now. <clears throat> so you still can put in some of these um, cool season crops that we've just been discussing. It's just that you're not going to have a particularly long season of them uh, bearing fruit because uh, bearing food because it's going to get increasingly warm from now and consequently they may end up going to seed before you get very much um, food off of it. However, um, that's why we call it fall and winter growing because it's best if you can get them in like September, October, November, and then you're eating off of them for October, November, December, January, February, March. So it's a lot of time that you can be uh, growing all the things we've discussed already in the cool season. And frankly, I like it growing then much better because we get so much food for all those months. The other criteria for the best conditions for cool season gardening are that you have direct sun for four to six hours. And that's because it's the greenery of the plant that you are eating or the root stems, leaves, and immature flowers. If the, uh, the plants like the peas, 
that have to go that extra step of putting out blossoms, getting them pollinated, and then developing the fruit, it needs another couple hours of sun daily, and it needs to be fed more, the fertilizer. So let's move on to the warm season. Now these, the parts we eat, are going to be the mature fruit and the immature fruit, only two kinds. So cantaloupe or any melon, um, this is hanging from a sturdy trellis and it is wrapped in a um, oh, pantyhose. Now the reason for that is that the pantyhose is what's hanging on the trellis at the top. Um, because if you just let the melon try, as the melon got larger, it would literally rip itself off of the trellis because all that weight that it's developing in the fruit, the stem part just can't hang on anymore. But the second value of, of hanging them this way is that pests cannot get through the pantyhose nylon even with all those little holes in order to eat the fruit. So it's a pest deterrent as well. Now these are winter squash. Now do make a, a note to yourself that all squash, summer squash and winter squash are all grown in the summer. The whole thing with growing in the summer gets them to this point. However, the mature, um, like here's a pumpkin, but all these other kind of squash are the ones that you let mature absolutely completely to the point that you cannot puncture it with your fingernail. And those are the ones that then are for storage so that months later you can be eating these all the way through the winter, you know, and making soups or baking them or whatever. But all squash are grown in the summer. And tomatoes, of course, are, I think, the entry vegetable to vegetable gardening. Everybody wants those tomatoes that they had as a kid or and that they remember from their grandmothers or their great grandmothers gardens. And so many different colors and shapes and flavors. And when they uh, mature, some of them um, are called early season, some are mid season and some are late season, just in the amount of time it takes to grow the plant and set the fruit and um, mature the fruit. The immature fruit that we eat of the warm season are beans. And of course, um, we can also let these dry completely and use the dried beans. And um, this is, uh, my apologies here, this is the mature corn that of course is all this beautiful colors. However, when it is nice and soft and sweet corn, that's what we eat um, as the immature fruit. Here's cucumbers, uh, long green ones, um, lemon cucumbers, eggplants, peppers. These are the sweet peppers. These are the chili peppers. And then here's the immature squash in many different kinds of shapes. So the best conditions for growing warm season crops are the air temperature of 65 to 95 and the minimum of eight hours direct sun every day. So some of the other um, elements to be considering when you're choosing your varieties, um, each of us has microclimates. Um, 
you know, one part of your yard might be warmer than another. Certainly, uh, if you have a garden space on the north side of the house, it's going to be completely different than the growing space on the south side of the house. Um, and so you're going to have to choose different varieties for each of those different spaces. Um, you do want to try to stretch the seasons by planting things early and late, as well as in what seemed to be the perfect time to be planting. And the harvest times are really going to be according to how you're going to be using the vegetable. If you're gonna be preserving them, you want the harvest to be all at one time so that you've got all your um, supplies out, whether you're canning or freezing or drying or what, you wanna be able to do this all at once. And consequently, you want the vegetables mostly to be all at once. Even if it's like over a three week period um, that one uh, kind of tomatoes might be maturing, um, it's gonna be three weeks instead of six or nine months that you have a couple tomatoes every day, which is what the other um, time um, frame is. For example, the all at once you will want like a celebrity tomato will bear all of its fruit within about a three month, I'm sorry, three week time period. And whereas a cherry tomato will bear its fruit a few every day or maybe as long as nine months. So that is gonna be great if you just want a couple tomatoes every night for your salad. Um, as opposed to preserving it, where you don't want to have to be hauling all your equipment in and out. You want to be able to do it all within a couple weeks time. The other thing is there's no such thing as a baby or a gourmet variety. Sometimes this is really just a marketing um, scheme to sell something more to you. Um, it's really just a matter of when you harvest it. Um, a baby vegetable, of course, will be the tiny one. It might even be here, the bloss squash blossoms, but these are the male blossoms. The female blossom will have a little swelling down here, which is going to be the squash. Um, however, if it doesn't get pollinated, it just dies off. But that may be the gourmet variety of your squash. So it's just a matter of what stage you're harvesting it that will determine if it has this fancy name to it. So germinating your seeds. Um, <clears throat> certainly as a first time gardener, it's a good idea to get the plants, the little what are called seedlings, already at the nurseries. You know, usually they're in a six pack or a four inch container. And you don't want to get the larger, like a gallon size, because the plant has so far developed that it's not going to translate well, uh, transfer well into your garden. It's going to have a hard time making that transition. But if you're going to be starting by seed, you do have to be cognizant of the soil temperatures. Now, this is different than the air temperatures. You know, the air temperature is what we talked about earlier, the difference between the cool season being 55 to 75. In soil temperature, we want this temperature to be between 50 and 65. And I think generally, um, this is going to just feel if you just put the palm of your hand right onto the soil, it's going to feel cold, not just chilly, but cold, if it's less than 50 degrees. Um, but you can still put a couple seeds out and see whether they germinate or not. 
Uh, for the warm season crops, it's going to be even warmer, 65 to 80. So this is why many times um, instructions have like to start tomato seeds indoors in January, because then the moisture and the light um, and the temperature will be more to the liking of the seed that wanted it to be at least 65 degrees in the soil. And then you move them outside. Um, but most of the time I will just start my seeds out in the garden um, or in a, a seedling tray, which is what this is here beneath all this lettuce here. Um, direct sowing uh, is best if you're going to be sowing big seeds. This is he seeds that you can handle pretty easily, like corn or beans um, or squash, cucumber. Um, many of those things are going to be the warm season crops. And roots crops like carrots or um, um, parsley and cilantro those things are all best done out in the garden um, because there is always going to be a, an offset time for the little plant to acclimate to your space in the garden as opposed to how it was uh, germinated in the first plant place. So this photo has um, a row of each of these different kinds of lettuce. And I tried to a good extent to alternate the colors so that I would actually be able to see, you know, whether one of these had come over here. And then you just knock it out. And the um, Speedling tray is a trademark. Um, it's available, the only place it's available is at uh, Peaceful Valley Farm Supply which is online as groworganic.com. It's in Nevada City, but it's only mail order. And um, these trays are a, a triangle shape. Let's see, yeah, here. This was grown in a, a speedling tray and um, it has some advantages, which I'll... Um, uh, the thing about it is that when the root, as it germinates and the roots hit the side of the container, it directs it, oops, directs it straight down, which goes to the hole in the bottom where it is what's called root pruning. It gets pruned just because it's um, at the end, it's no longer nice and warm and moist. It's cold air, so it quits. Whereas commercially, um, what is called a plug tray, um, you'll see the roots kind of go all the way around. And then if they develop too far, they start circling at the bottom. And that's the case with six packs as well. And even some four inches uh, containers that when you, when you choose those, a plant in there, you're gonna have to rough up the, uh, the root ball so that the roots then will spread out into your native soil instead of just continuing around making the big circle. So transplanting, um, these are the little seedlings, whether you've started them yourself or whether you um, bought the six pack or the four inch container, um, and certainly the larger ones. Uh, most of the time you will plant it at the same depth that it is in the container because that's where it grew. It has made that distinction between the roots and the, the stem and then the growing point. The two exceptions of course are tomatoes, which you always uh, plant deeper because it will, it's the one plant that will develop um, roots along its stem. So planting it deep um, 
say four inches um, under the soil so the stem is under the ground four inches, that will have roots coming out. But other plants don't do that. Um, and then of course, potatoes you're putting underground anyway. And so it's kind of, um, it's obvious that you're planting it not at the depth it was at the container because it wasn't, you planted it underground. So you want to make sure that the growing point is above the ground. And that is going to be right at that junction of the stem and the, the roots. You want always to handle it by its leaves or by its roots, not the stem, because the plant can repair, um, can add more leaves or more roots if something gets damaged. But if you squish this part, the stem, it can't grow a new one. It's not like there's going to be another one coming up from the roots. So that's why if you notice that my hand is holding these by the leaves. So feed the soil, not the plants. These are quite a few um, uh, approaches to gardening over the millennia. And some of the latest terms that have been applied to this concept are organic, biodynamic, French intensive. In um, you know, the mid 1800s through the beginning of the 1900s, um, soil was described as either rich, in which case it meant that it was fertile with a lot of nutrition in it, or lean, that it was lacking in nutrients. Also, um, if any of you have uh, farmers in your background, especially in the mid Midwest, or have heard um, soil mentioned as being sweet or sour, they literally tasted the soil. And so if it was sweet, it was more of the mid range of the P, uh, pH, or if it was sour, it was acidic, which is the upper um, gradients. And um, for most vegetables, they prefer um, the number of 6.5, which if any of you have the Master Gardener Handbook, which is available to the public, it's on page 63. And this is a wonderful compost pile at one of our community gardens and the uh, Master Gardener who was in charge of the garden, let me take its picture and use it as my logo. So one of the techniques is raised beds. And these will enable a early season and late season warming of the soil um, so that you can continue growing a lot of things in the um, raised beds. They provide good drainage because you're not walking in them. You're not stomping around and compacting the soil. And consequently, the roots can go just about anywhere in that soil. It is easy to work it because it's uncompacted. And of course, be, you've been not walking within that root zone. So the roots have an, a very easy way of being able to utilize all the nutrients and the water because they haven't been stopped around. And um, you can have access for wheelchairs and for elders with less bending and increased seating. You'll see that these boards are set upright, whereas these boards have the one on top of it so that it's maybe a six, eight inch uh, width that can be easily sit on. And consequently, um, um, you can cultivate the garden or put in plants or harvest or whatever 
um, just because of that increased seeding. So this is at the um, Altadena Community Garden where it's paved and then concrete blocks that make up the um, bed uh, edges. And consequently, this is for the wheelchair section of the garden because it is uh, concrete pavement that they can uh, roll along. So we'll move on to succession planting. And this is how to get a lot more food than just planting things once. And then when the food runs out of that, you're out of luck. And because this is Southern California, I really find that a lot of these things, um, well, even February, um, like I, for seeds in the garden, like the beets that are shown here, um, I really am putting things in um, for the cool season from um, even October. You know, it, it usually is gotten with our global warming. Um, it really has ended up being warmer, longer in the fall and earlier in the spring. So consequently, it's, it's almost like there's no winter. Um, and consequently, I just consider that as another reason that every couple of weeks, plant some more seeds. Um, there is a distinction between those plants that are like a one-time use, like beets. You know, once you pull it, that's it though you can get several crops of greenery off of them, um, especially if you've determined that you're growing beets for the greens, um, which of course are high in nutrition, um, or you're growing them for the beets because you can harvest a couple of sets of leaves and still end up with a decent sized globe for the beet itself. However, it's, it's really better to grow like onions or beets. If you're gonna be cutting them off frequently, then just consider that that's what that particular um, generation is going to be. Um, and let the beets and the onions grow without harvesting until they've completely developed their globe. Um, so every one or two weeks for a short harvest period um, or bolt thrown things like cilantro and lettuce in the summer, um, you're just not going to be able to extend it um, just because it's that's what it does. However, for long harvest period like lettuce in the fall or winter or early spring, you can be sowing every three or four weeks because Again, you're going to be harvesting those, the outer leaves of the um, lettuce plant um, or the chard or the kale or whatever it is, and it's going to keep on growing. So it really is a matter of did that thing germinate from seed or do you have to sow another batch of it? Um, it's really kind of puzzling. And um, I have found a really hit or miss. You know, it's not something that you are being a good or bad gardener. It's just the accident of the timing and the weather and whether or not it rained and whether or not you watered it, all that stuff. Because in many cases, I will be sowing peas every three weeks all the way from fall. And yet, finally, the batch that I sow in February is going to be the one that all of them come up. So it's like that was, uh, in a sense, it was my wasted effort, or a couple of them would come up early. Um, but I prefer to keep doing that just in the hopes that something might come up and give me a consecutive kind of crop to it. So 
Um, so just do it every every once in a while, and then you'll get some food out of it. Now this example here was kind of a silly thing that I did. These are the beets that are left over from a previous sowing, and they are grown, and I've been harvesting them rest from the batch because they do mature at different rates. You'll have small beets and big beets. So just harvest the ones that are at the size that you want. And I prefer about um, an inch and a half. Um, and then when you're done harvesting off of that batch, rewater that area. Because what will happen is that as you pull some up, you will also inadvertently be pulling some of the tiny ones up and you want them to stay in there and develop further. So you're watering that area again, will literally melt all the soil back down around the beet roots that extend from the bottom of the little baby ball. So in <clears throat> this area, I had re-sown uh, this kind here in this middle area, this one, and this I had sown all of these over here. But then of course I watered the whole area and all the seeds got blown all the way around. So it was like it didn't make much difference. I couldn't test which ones were good, which ones I liked better, because they'd all just mixed up by themselves because I had watered the area. But the advantage was that these were three different kinds of beets. One was the purple, one was that Chiogia, which is the one that looked like a target. And then another one, the third one was the orange color. So even though they had all mixed up together and were germinating together, I could tell which ones were which once I did harvest them. But you know, you always do something like that in gardening and you just, you feel dumb afterwards, but so what? You learn something. Okay, I'm not gonna go there. Uh, spacing. Now these are all different reasons that determine how closely or how far apart you space something. Either putting in the seed or transplanting the little plants. So one uh, determination is by the germination and maturity rate. Radishes germinate very quickly and carrots germinate very slowly, really up to three weeks, whereas radishes might be two or three days. So one technique is to mix your radishes and your carrots. Now this is even if you don't eat radishes, okay? Or for that matter, if you don't eat carrots. Um, mix the seed together sow it in a little area. And I always prefer to sow it in an area, um, you know, not, not in a row. Um, if you did rows close together, that would be fine. But the point is to use your entire area of your soil um, that has been amended with compost and manure so that all that rich, resource is available to the seeds and the uh, transplants. So you sow together the radishes and the carrots, you know, you intertwine it. And <clears throat> let me finish, let that finish. Okay. So you, you plant them together, you intertwine all of the seeds, and then the radishes, which will, and you uh, water it to settle them into the seed nicely. The radishes will germinate within a couple days and the carrots won't. But as the radishes gradually uh, get larger and put out their roots and their globes, 
they keep the subsurface of the soil moving, so to speak. It won't um, cast a crust over the soil because carrot seeds are very um, um, unenergetic, shall we say. They don't do well at punching up through soil that has a crust on it. So, but if your radishes are gradually keeping this soil from crusting over, the carrots in that three week period of time, if you keep the soil watered, those carrots will germinate and come through. So by the time that you want to eat the radishes three weeks later, you'll be pulling those uh, gently and watering it so that the carrots stay connected. And then you, um, um, the carrots will be developing over the several weeks that it will take them to mature. So um, root, uh, the growing zone is also a criteria that you can use. Some things grow at the root level, like garlic. Some things, the roots are right at the surface level, like bok choy, and some of the greenery is right at the above the soil. In the mid air is cabbages, and then up on trellises is peas. So if you think in terms of the garden as an up down kind of perspective, that you've got the root zone, you've got the surface area, you've got mid air, and you've got trellis. Um, you can be growing all these things right next to one another because they are using different areas of that root or airspace in order to put out the bulk of their foliage. Because you always want to have foliage growing close enough together so that it just barely touches when it's mature and consequently it shades the soil and you won't have so many weeds coming up because the soil is shaded. So that's what this accomplishes. The sun orientation, um, like planting lettuce on the north side of peas or corn during the summer, any of the lettuces that are uh, bolt tolerant, um, because they will have the shade of the peas or the corn. So they'll last a couple more weeks before the heat just determines that they're going to send up their um, seed stalks. Another criteria is that the water zone, that you have the plants growing together that have the same water needs. For example, you really can't have a complete herb bed, a bed just of herbs, an herb garden. Because some things like um, uh, cilantro, basil, they want lots of water. But your lavender and your uh, rosemary don't want any water. They're used to being on a rocky hillside in Greece. Okay? So putting them right next to one another, they're both going to be unhappy. So you need to separate, put together those things that are going to be needing lots of water, put them together and keep the ones that don't want much water in a different, like in a different raised bed where you have a different watering um, system going. Support and pest deterrent is like a three sisters garden, which is corn, beans, and squash. This is where you plant the corn. And after it's about a foot tall, um, you plant the beans, the pole beans. Um, and the beans crawl up the corn, and then the squash shades the whole base of the soil so that if where you're watering, the squash covers that area. 
and doesn't allow the evaporation. So it keeps all the moisture right in the, the uh, soil right there. The other consideration is the mature size of the plant. Um, and this is where square foot gardening really comes into um, a good plan. Although this person didn't quite understand the concept because they had apparently not grown cabbages before. They put one cabbage right next to the other in square feet, when in fact this cabbage will take three by three if they had planted it in the center because it's about a three foot, four foot reach that all those leaves of the cabbage will reach. So you have to know the mature size of the plant. So back to the illustration down here, here are the little um, spinaches or lettuces that are planted and you see it's kind of triangulated here. And you harvest those outer leaves so that the, um, the plant, this has just been harvested, which is why there's all the blank space in between each of the plants. But when, as it grows, um, like within a week's period of time, then you harvest all those outer leaves and you leave the three or four center leaves to continue developing. And it's got the row of celery. And then at the back, it has these broccoli plants. So you see that how um, there's like four of them in this area at the back, because they're each going to get about two and a half feet wide. Now, this is an example of the seasonal growing distinction. Strawberries and lettuce both were put in in November. And all winter long, the lettuce grows nicely and you harvest it. And it starts, but the, the strawberries are kind of just sitting there. There's not much foliage up on the top, but it's doing a good job of establishing the root system down below. And then in the early spring, the lettuce starts to bolt because of the hot weather. And so you can pull that out and then the strawberries really take off and put out lots of foliage up on top and putting out the blossoms and then the fruit. Meanwhile, the real, at the winter, the root growth is what was going on with the strawberries and the top growth is what was going on with the lettuce. Here's the uh, directional kind of planting they have the, and the time of the harvest, because here's all bok choy at the, um, right near the edge of the pathway. So you can access it to harvest the outer leaves. And then there's the peas on the trellises in the center. And then at the back here are all the cabbages or the cauliflowers at the back. Now you can't see, but on this side, there's quite a drop of about two feet. So I don't wanna go back, have to go back there. That's why the cabbages are there because it's gonna be a one-time harvest for those. When they get large enough, I go back there and I harvest the one cabbage or the one cauliflower. Whereas these are almost gonna be a daily kind of thing. So you, on all of these, you have to think about each one of these elements in order to determine how closely you plant something. Okay, prolysing. Um, you're using the air space for growing. See, it's all up in the air instead of sprawling on the ground. Uh, you are using a more intensive use of the amended soil. You know, since you went into all the effort of amending that bed, now you want those roots to be able to go everywhere and pick up that nutrition. Because 
the greater amount of all of the foliage is up in the air, you have better circulation and consequently fewer pest problems. Um, and pests includes diseases as well as insects and small critters. And even the harvests are clean because they're literally off of the ground. So lengthening the seasons is another um, way of getting more food off of the plants that you have growing. Um, my recommendation always is to plant despite the weather because you never know what's going to happen. Um, you know, is it going to stay cool? Is it going to get suddenly hot? Um, so it, it, you never know what's really going to happen. So keep planting. Um, and then hopefully you'll be lucky with there will be some that die, but some don't. And they're the ones that end up giving you a lot of food. The row covers and germination shading are a way of uh, reducing the direct sun. However, like these lettuces are already pretty mature, so they're really not going to be benefited very much um, by the shade because the air temperature is what is going to set the hormone change in the lettuce so that they start putting up their um, uh, seed stalks. Another way of lengthening um, the seasons for plants is to keep fertilizing them, keep watering them, just so that they're healthy and they're pulling all that nutrition and water into the plants to keep them growing very nicely. If they get a bit stressed, they're gonna uh, attract pests and they're gonna die anyway. Continuing to harvest, is also a way of lengthening that season. Um, we would like our peppers very ripe. So I always have to run the risk of letting it ripen to the point where the plant thinks it's done its whole um, reproduction scheme. You know, I've already got all these fruits out there with all that nice seeds in there to continue my life. So I'm not gonna put out any more blossoms. Um, so that's the hormone shift that you have to try to defeat if you want to harvest things um, very much later in the season. Okay, irrigation is a biggie and I have, there's three separate elements to deal with here. The depth of the irrigation, the frequency of the irrigation and different methods. So first, the depth. The depth stays the same year round because the root depth is the thing of the entire root system remains moist, okay? Each plant has its own genetic indication of how deep its roots will go. And that chart will be on the handout for the container gardening workshop. Um, consequently, it's to that depth, whether it's going to be six inches for lettuce, or if it's going to be two feet for the asparagus, or three feet for the tomatoes. So consequently, the depth of the water has to remain the same because of whatever the plant is that is being grown. So to the foot here, it's celery, lettuce, onion, radish, potato. Two feet is beans, carrots, cucumber, eggplant, pepper, squash. And really deep ones to three feet is the asparagus, globe artichoke, melon, pumpkin, tomato. The frequency is the watering that changes. And that's if it's super hot or if it's not, um, warm at all, if we've had rain, those kinds of things. So it depends on the weather and your finger test below the mulch. The finger test is just taking your, your finger and putting it 
into the soil below any mulch that you have. If it's dry at the tip of your finger, then it needs water. In spring, it might be like once every three weeks or so. Um, summer, it might be once a week, but more according to the specific amount of foliage it's got and respiration rate. So like this tomato plant has a huge amount of foliage to it, which means it's going to respire a lot every day in the summer. And especially when it gets to be over 95 degrees, um, then you really have to make the point of watering deeply. And especially on that previous section, we said tomatoes can go down three feet. In the fall, again, it might only be once every two weeks and winter, maybe once a month if we get no rain. And certainly here in Pasadena, we've gotten, I think 5.69 inches of rain this winter, which is nothing. I think that's almost the least we've ever gotten. I think one year it was four inches. So we know we're gonna have to be watering, but the trick is, the depth you want it to go as deep as those particular plants are growing in your area. So methods, there's a whole bunch of methods. A handheld hose, like here, um, for specific plant needs and to clean the foliage undersides, which there are little openings called stomates, and also pests, like if any of you have experienced the white fly, it creates a whole circular pattern, um, kind of cottony looking underneath side of the leaves. So an overhead sprinkler washes off the dust so that the leaves can do their photosynthesis um, effectively. The mini tube drip emitters um, are good for specific uh, locations of plants. However, I prefer the soaker hoses like this one that string in a whole area, in this case around an orange tree, because from the oozing part of the hose here, it'll go out about five inches on each side. So by putting the rings about a foot apart, I, and when I turn this on, this entire root zone area will stay moist. And these, this is a five gallon nursery container, like what you would buy a fruit tree in. I buried it almost to its rim. And then this is all a bunch of mulch and stuff on top. And it's left empty because then you put the hose like this one here, you put the hose in there, it fills the bucket. And at the base of that bucket are those four or five holes that were drainage holes in the container. And that goes out into the soil, a good foot below the surface of the soil. So that every time you water, every time you fill this container, it's watering all these plants right around here at a foot deep. And now also I can you know, fill it with the hose here, but this makes it really handy because you can just put the hose in there and go off and do something else like harvesting or weeding or anything else. Meanwhile, this will fill up, it'll overflow and go into this whole area here, kind of making a bit of a lake, just like this area is filled up with water or here around the fruit tree. And that way the entire area is moist. And consequently those roots can go anywhere for that moisture. So mulch is about the last gardening technique that we will be talking with about. And it does these five magic things. It conserves the soil moisture because it's covering the soil and consequently the moisture that you put into the soil can't evaporate off. 
it moderates the soil temperature for the same reason, because that mulch is just keeping the sun away from the surface of the soil. So it is just moderate temperature. It keeps the weeds from germinating and any that do are easy to pull because they've had to come all the way up through all that mulch. It lessens erosion because the whatever rain or water gets directly onto the soil, it soaks right in because the mulch has kept it from getting to the soil and sweeping it away down the street. And lastly, as it breaks down, that mulch enriches the soil nutrition and feeds the beneficial microorganisms in the soil. And so roots are very happy. So finally, of course, the whole reason we're doing all this is the harvest. And individual taste preferences will determine when you harvest something. For example, on a tomato or on a peach or um, just about anything, on a pea, you can harvest it at a certain point and you can decide, well, that was good, but then harvest it several days later, another one. Oh, I like that one better or no, that, that still doesn't taste ripe yet. And you do this four, five, six times on that same kind of a plant. And then you decide when you like it the best. And that's your perfect time of harvest. And of course, plants have a billion uses, whether you utilize the foliage, the blossoms, the immature fruit, the different stages of maturity, just the mature fruit or the seeds. And some plants you can do several different stages. On lettuce, chard, collards and kales, all those greens, bok choys, harvest just the outer leaves. The plant will continue growing until it finally bolts, which could be a good nine months worth of food off of there. And I, one year I did grow about six different kinds of kale because I wanted to see which ones I really liked the taste of, which I liked looking at growing in the garden and which I just felt I just didn't appreciate them sufficiently to bother wasting garden space. So I did find that the Tuscan kale, the Lassolata or dinosaur kale, you know, the one with the long leaves that are all kind of lumpy bumpy. Those I liked the best for eating. And also it lasted, one plant lasted for three years because even though it, um, I kept harvesting the outer leaves, it kept putting out new branches that also had those nice tender small leaves. Um, and it finally took about, three years before it was about six feet tall and I just decided I was going to start with a new plant again. And I just chopped that one down and put it in the compost pile. So I never did know how long it could have grown forever. Okay, one last thing if you wanna save seeds. Now, August 3rd, 2016, my blog goes into a vast amount of instructions and detail about how to save seeds from the items in your garden. So August 3rd, 2016. Um, now this is just in small containers so that I can show the process all at once here. But generally you do this in a, um, a gallon size stainless or glass bowl. So what you do, um, well, the whole point here is that <clears throat> it's only for seeds that are what called open pollinated, not hybrid 
hybrid means the two have come together and any of the seeds are probably going to be vastly different. But open pollinated or heirloom means they are going to come the same every time you save the seeds. And the problem with wet seeds like tomatoes, melon, squash, you know, where it's got that um, mushy stuff around the seeds is that that can potentially carry a virus in that membrane. So it has to be fermented off. So that's what this process is. You squish together a bunch of tomatoes of that particular kind you want. You set it out, you fill it with water, you set it outside. It spoils over several days. It's going to stink. So be sure to put it way far away from windows or anything. You'd repeat this several times until there's no more fermentation going on. And then you dry the seed and you um, dry it, you rinse it completely, then you dry it on a um, um, china or uh, plate, a hard plate, not paper plate, um, so that it dries completely and separates, and then you pack them away for later on, either to share with other gardeners or um, start again the next season. Now, dry ones like chili peppers or regular peppers or lettuce, uh, peas, those don't have that mucous membrane on them. So they can just be dried straight just until they're absolutely crispy. If there's any amount of moisture left in the pod, it's gonna rot the seed. So let it dry absolutely crispy. And that is it. Eat your yard. Yes. Thank you so much. If we could give a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, Yvonne. We do have a couple of questions. Okay. From, from people, let me scroll back. So we had one question from Jason and he mentioned, he, uh, he's asking colored corn is the same as yellow corn. And um, he wants a little bit more clarification if yellow corn is just immature. No, um, corn comes in all colors. And, but the two different kinds of corn are sweet corn, which is what we eat when we go to the store and we buy it and we put it on the barbecue and we love it. Whereas the corn that is used to make tortillas and corn meal, that is called flint or dent corn because it has a little dent in the top of it. And that's, that's a different kind of corn. You don't want to grow those two together because they'll cross pollinate and it'll mean you can't make it into popcorn and you can't make it, you can't eat it as a fresh corn. Both of them will taste awful. So, but the corn itself is in the genetics what the color will be. Because sometimes, you know, there'll be that beautiful speckled corn, um, and sometimes it'll be just regular white corn or yellow corn. So it's different. Okay, thank you for that. And then we also have another question where the person's asking, do you recommend Epsom salt as a mineral fertilizer when growing vegetables? We really don't need it here in Southern California. Um, so it, not really. You're just use. gonna overload the magnesium if you put it in. Okay. And then which companion plants do you recommend planting to avoid unwanted pests? That's a whole level of non-science that I don't deal with. Um, <laughs> if you just Google companion planting, um, there's a lot of recommendations. So, and some of them are touted as helping with certain pests. Some of them are more of a general kind of health of the plants. 
So um, just Google that and follow through on some of those um, recommendations if you choose to, but there's not much actual science to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good to know. And do you personally, do you recommend using um, cover crops as opposed to mulch in the garden? Um, well, it's a good idea because certainly when you, you let it grow to a certain amount and then you dig it in, it's also called green manure. Um, but you do have to let it break down and all that. So um, it's very helpful for people more who get real winters to grow it and, and then turn it into their soil. And then the next year, or at least the next season, they will go ahead and actually plant something in there. But there is a lot of time that it takes in order to break all that down and have all those microorganisms able to incorporate that so that it's in a form that the plant roots can pick it up. Okay. And then maintaining what I really the- What I prefer to do is more like rotating your crops so that you have certain crops following other crops that are going to be either um, holding the nitrogen or making it available to the next uh, plant. And therefore, you're, um, it's kind of like what plants are really heavy feeders, you follow them with not heavy feeders so that it all reincorporates into the soil. So in essence, you're growing plants to accomplish the same thing rather than putting them out of um, service because you need to let it break all down. Just keep maintaining that balance between yeah. the plants that need the heavy mineral contents and then the ones that don't. That's right. Great. So we, we have about um, 12 minutes left. If anyone else has uh, some questions, they can drop in the chat or um, if anyone wants to unmute themselves, feel free to, to do so. Uh, let me tell you two um, things. The last two blogs that I have put on my website were the warm season crops um, troubleshooting so problems and solutions. And then the time before that was the cool season crops, um, tr uh, problems and solutions. And the uh, warm season one at the very bottom has the links that I've done uh, previously or links to the blogs that I had done previously about tomatoes specifically. So in terms of problems, um, you know, there's a lot of possible problems, none of which may happen or one or two would happen in your gardens, but it's nice to have those as referrals um, because then you can kind of go down the whole list and see what might be happening. And with the solutions, um, much of the time it is um, a nutrition or a fertilizer issue. Um, as opposed to you know going in there and ripping out the plant. Okay. Yeah. So those are good. Um, the other thing I would like to remind everybody of when they go on to the website, my search bar is on my blog page. On the right hand side, right above where it has the archives for all the past blogs, which is listed by month. Um, and so you can put anything in there, like growing tomatoes or pruning fruit trees or whatever it is. And that will take you to a list that is of all the mentions that I have made in, in previous posts. So those are good things to, to know exactly where they are so that you can find what you're really looking for. And it's not just vegetables, it's also flowers and other types of oh, yeah. plants as um, well. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I, I really particularly most talk about um, vegetables, but you know, roses and fruit trees and succulents and the whole shebang 
it's all mm -hmm. in there somewhere. Lots of information, very helpful. Yeah. yeah. And certainly the web um, web links page also is a, a tremendous uh, collection of um, information that you really should, um, when you have nothing else to do in these COVID times, um, just wander around the website and see what uh, what all is there. The um, and I usually put a um, one of those news articles are just absolutely fascinating. Um, I saw a recent one on monarch, monarch butterflies. Yes. Uh huh. The LA Times. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she did a great job because she really lets you know where to purchase the correct ones. You know, it's it's one thing to have all the um, Asclepius available at Home Depot, but it's all the red orange ones that end up being pretty all year long. But that's the problem with those plants because it doesn't give the proper nutrition. Um, and it does harbor some of the viruses that then end up get to the, the monarchs. And so it ends up being a problem. And here you were thinking you were doing a good thing in your garden, you know. So it's always needing to find print. That's another question I actually have for you. Do you prefer buying um, seedlings from Home Depot or nurseries? Well, like you know, place. since Home Depot, I think a couple of years ago, started carrying all organic um, vegetables. I don't know about the ornamentals, but um, I've been very proud of them that they actually uh, um, made all the organics source as the availability for them. So all the vegetables are organic with them, but it's really just a matter of where, um, where you want to purchase and who has the particular items that you're looking for. I will make a note though, when you showed the coming events, um, the tomato mania at Desconso is complete, has been sold out since the announcement went up. So, you know, with the COVID, they were requiring making an appointment and getting a pass that you had to show when you appeared. And like, I couldn't get one because it was already closed. So many people wanted to go. The Tomato Mania people sent around a notice saying, well, we're still having our um, um, things available, the plants available in other places. One of which is um, the Fig Nursery, which is on Figueroa um, in LA. I think it's, and they have been really good at, um, they had one of the very first <coughs> big earth supply. It's 3577 North Figueroa. Um, and just the, earlier this week, they opened it up so you don't have to have an appointment to go to the nursery. So you can just show up. And okay. they had the very first tomato mania um, here in, I think it was the beginning of March. Um, and so I bought a whole bunch of my tomatoes then. Um, that's another thing I would suggest planting, well, I guess if, if you folks don't have any place to plant it, but I plant the first tomatoes that I can find, like the sun gold cherry and some celebrities and some of my other favorite ones that are very common. I buy those as soon as I can see them in a nursery somewhere. And that's usually middle of February. And then another three weeks later, I will plant some more mm -hmm. of whatever varieties I know that I want. And then another three weeks later, I'll plant a third batch. Because then what happens, that's part of that succession planting that 
the tomatoes, like the sun gold is the cherry. So it's going to be bearing this entire time. But like the celebrity and some of the others that are the determinant varieties that they, you know, they'll develop, they'll do all their fruit and then they'll die. Those I plant another one like every three weeks in order to have, uh, you know, one plant will bear, it'll die. The next plant will be about ready. It'll bear, it'll die. And so that way I can continue having that kind of tomatoes for months. Mm -hmm. Just the rotating only limit, the plants. Mm -hmm. I think, is that um, about the beginning of May, I used to plant yet another batch, but I don't any longer because over the last several years of the drought, I never, mm -hmm. those plants never survived long enough, even with a lot of water that I was giving them. So I just mm -hmm. decided not to waste the water anymore on those. So I will plant my successive plantings until about the middle to the end of April. And that's it. So from February, February, March, April, that's three months worth of um, successive plantings of the tomatoes. So that way I, we get lots of tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> and I particularly in like the uh, Cherokee purple and uh, black creme. Um, and there are several others that I, uh, green, uh, green, well, zebra, um, green zebra um, is kind of a nice stripy one. And that is green. And then when the intersections of it turn golden, that's when you ripen. And that's mm -hmm. when you pick it. Oh, wow. So. Lots of varieties of tomatoes, huh? But yeah, yeah. we have about two, two minutes left. Um, maybe nobody has any questions and, um, or if they do, please unmute yourself and let us know. If not, thank you everyone for sticking with us until three o'clock. I hope you all learned something and be sure to review the handout that was put in the chat that Yvonne gave. It describes all of her slides. And just in case you didn't have any time to take any notes and you were just focused on listening to her, um, that's a great resource to use as well. So Noelle uh, says, thank you so much for this workshop. And we did have a couple of um, like gratitude messages that people were sending in through great. Um, throughout the session. So. Well, it's always nice to show some of the tricks that I have learned over all these years. Yes, we, we appreciate all of your knowledge and you taking the time to, to sit down with us and, and talk today. Sure. All of this is necessary. Yeah. We have about one more minute left. We can, I can stop.